There are no missions like Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. These twin probes have traveled across the solar system, visited the gas giant planets, and now have reached interstellar space. They have captured the imagination of everyone who has ever heard of them. Almost half a century since their launch, they are still going strong. We are speaking to Dr. Linda Spilker from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, who was there at the very beginning and now serves as the Voyager project scientist. Thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us. Would you like to start by introducing yourself? Well, hi, my name is Linda Spilker. I'm currently the Voyager Project Scientist. I work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and I've been there for 48 years. It is a very great honor and absolute pleasure to be able to speak to you about the incredible missions that are Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. I'd like to start by asking you about your experience with Voyager at the very beginning. So if you can go back 47, 48 years, uh, and if you could tell us a little bit about what it was like working at JPL back then and working on such a phenomenal mission. I started working at the Jet Propulsion Lab in January 1977, and they gave me a choice. Did I want to work on a mission that would be launching in the fall called Voyager or the Viking Extended Mission? And of course, my first question was, well, I've never heard of Voyager. Where's Voyager going? And they said Jupiter and Saturn, and if all goes well, on to Uranus and Neptune. And I remember as a small child getting a tiny telescope out and looking at Jupiter and the rings of Saturn. And so I said, sign me up. I want to work on Voyager. I'd love to get close up views of these places. And so I was fortunate enough to start. I got to actually go to the launch of Voyager, you know, Voyager 2 launched first, and actually see the spacecraft lift up off the pad, hear that roar as the sound came out of the rockets, and then uh, was part of preparing then for what were the first two Jupiter flybys, uh, Saturn. I actually stayed with the Voyager mission through the Neptune flyby in 1989. And after that, uh, I, I was given a chance to go work on another mission called Cassini, which would go back to Saturn and orbit Saturn. And so I didn't want to miss out on that chance. I had, in the meantime, put together a PhD thesis on Saturn's rings, and I thought, oh, I want to go back. I want to study those rings in even more detail. And uh, so I did that for about 30 years. And once Cassini ended with that grand finale plunge into the atmosphere of Saturn to protect the ocean worlds Enceladus and Titan, I had a chance to go back to Voyager and I thought, what a perfect way to end my career. What a career. Absolutely fascinating. I want to ask you a million questions, but let's start back at the very beginning. Voyager was always planned as an incredible mission, visiting the giant planets of the solar system. What were the expectations back then? I'm sure there were a lot of hope of learning so much about Jupiter and Saturn, and then Uranus and Neptune. But were the people on the team expecting all the major discoveries that Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 delivered? Well, I think initially, when Voyager launched, it was just planned to be a four-year mission which would have been the two flybys of Jupiter and two flybys of Saturn. So that was the Voyager Prime mission. And at the time, if you think about it, we had, what did we have to compare to the moons of the outer solar system? Well, we had our own moon. And so there was a lot of thinking that these are small worlds. They're probably have frozen solid and they're, you know, probably heavily cratered would look a lot like our moon. And so there were so many ideas that we had that Voyager proved was not correct. Uh, the first moon we flew by was the outer big moon Callisto, heavily cratered, you know, it fit the, the lunar model quite well. Then we get to Ganymede, fewer craters, kind of look like sort of a, a terrain where there'd been some shifting in tectonics and we're all, hmm, maybe every moon doesn't look like our own moon after all. And then of course came Europa, this bright icy world pretty much crater-free, very few craters, cracks and fractures, and, and a young surface to have a surface that bright, white, and icy told you that it had to be relatively young compared to the age of the solar system. And so more head scratching and, and big grins because it's always nice when you have something new to try and understand and, and explain. And then of course came the IO flyby. Here's this world with colors almost looking like a giant pizza with oranges and yellows and whites and totally, totally different from any of the other moons of the big moons in the Jupiter system. And ultimately Voyager discovered that there were active volcanoes on the surface of Io. And so I think in that single first flyby 
by Voyager 1 of the, the Jovian moons, it sort of shattered our idea of just what a moon could look like. And we had to sort of open up our imaginations to what the possibilities might be and then start to try and explain uh, what Voyager had actually seen. And you could say equally there were things about the atmosphere, about the magnetosphere, that we had basically used our model, the Earth, to try and understand. And when we get up close and get inside, we find so many more interesting things. We, we didn't think Jupiter had a ring, you know, for a lot. We just said, oh, it doesn't have a ring. That's Saturn is the planet with rings. But just in case, let's take a picture, a long exposure, and sure enough, there was a ring in the picture. And then that allowed Voyager 2 to go back and take more detailed pictures of Jupiter's ring. So all along with each flyby, uh, planetary flyby, there were new discoveries and it was just so much fun to be part of that mission. It sounds incredible. And then at some point they decided, oh, we can also do Uranus and Neptune. That's right. Uh, the spacecraft were both healthy and working well. Uh, Voyager 1's main target was to fly close to Titan. Titan had this thick photochemical haze. And unfortunately, we weren't carrying the kinds of instruments to really probe through the haze. And so that sort of gave us the green light then to take Voyager 2, not fly close to Titan again, but instead go on to Uranus and Neptune. And of course, the Voyager data were key to what led to the Cassini mission. Because right away, as soon as those scientists saw we can't see the surface of Titan, it immediately led to plans for another mission, which turned out to be Cassini, that would carry a European belt probe called Huygens that would parachute into the atmosphere of Titan and land on the surface and on the way down get an incredible set of images of the surface. And then Cassini did carry instruments, radar, infrared, we could also see the surface so that we did map the surface of Titan. But it really was Voyager and that Voyager 1 flyby of Titan that led to the Cassini mission. I love the connection between all these missions how important the Voyagers were, but also how fundamental they were to push for new mission. Just to jump ahead a little bit, how was your experience on Cassini? Many of the same scientists that worked on Voyager were also part of Cassini, and so it was sort of like transferring that knowledge and those scientists onto Cassini and then helping train the next generation of scientists some of whom probably weren't even born at the time Voyager launched. So that was a very exciting time. And just building on the Voyager discoveries, in particular, I'll just name one. That was the tiny moon Enceladus, bright, white, and icy, very similar to Europa. And uh, Voyager, at the time Voyager flew by, the South Pole was in darkness, just the seasons that we had at Saturn. But when Cassini got there, we actually saw active jets of material shooting out of the South Pole sending tiny icy particles into space, creating the E-ring, in which Enceladus is in the center. And then as Cassini mission continued, finding there was a global liquid water ocean underneath the icy crust of Enceladus. And that local global ocean had the key ingredients for life because Cassini flew through those jets and the plume seven times measuring the composition of the gases and the particles. So really tantalizing to think perhaps there are ocean worlds in our own solar system that might have conditions that are right for life. There's a mission by NASA planning to go to Titan called Dragonfly, which is very exciting. And also another mission that builds on different mission, which is what we learn from Ingenuity on Mars. But if you had the money and power, would you like to send an Eric Cassini to Saturn to maybe even see more about Enceladus and not just Titan? Well, if I could have another mission or even a two missions, I'd send orbiters to Uranus and Neptune. That so far, Voyager is the only spacecraft to fly by those two ice giants. And we know that many ice giant type planets circle other stars. And so we need, I think, to understand more about these worlds, much smaller than Jupiter and Saturn, but each with its own interesting set of moons, rings, uh, and atmospheres and to learn more about these two worlds. So I, I take a pair of Cassinis and send one to Uranus and one to Neptune. And of course, Triton at Neptune with active geysers coming out of its pole, we, we want to go back and see, are those geysers still active? What creates them? You know, is perhaps Triton an ice, an icy world, you know, one of these water worlds too. Let's see what we can find out. 
sounds like a perfect plan to just send more and more missions. I completely agree with that. Let's go back to the Voyager back in 1919 when you left to move on to Cassini. Did you have any expectation that they would just continue all the way into interstellar space? I personally didn't because we had heard all along that once we were past the first four years of the mission, the Voyagers were now getting to be quite old. And that was the story pretty much through the decades. As the Voyager mission continued well past the Neptune flyby, that it's probably just a few more years that the Voyagers will last. And yet they just kept on going. Any problems that came up, a very clever group of engineers would solve. And the initial design of the Voyagers was really a very robust design. We're coming up on the you know, 48th anniversary this fall. The two Voyagers are still going strong. And it is incredible that they just keep going Every single story that we get, and a lot of it seems like fighting against the odds of very old spacecraft, but they always come out on top with the help of a fantastic team of engineers that solve problems while the probes are tens of billions of kilometers away. Now, to the modern day, they are in interstellar space, and as you said, they are still going strong. What is your hope for the next several years of the Voyager missions? Well, the two Voyagers are now flying in interstellar space and making discoveries there just as they did with the planetary flyby. So all along the way through the planetary flybys and then on out to the heliopause crossings in 2012 and 2018, that boundary between the solar wind and the interstellar medium uh, continued to return data with surprises in them. And so my hope is, is that Voyager continues to keep going. Some of the surprises we found, for instance, we expected once we crossed out of the heliopause, that sphere of influence of our sun, that the magnetic field would shift from the dire solar direction into the interstellar direction of the magnetic field. That hasn't happened yet. And so it seems like the influence from the sun persists out much further than we had thought previously. In fact, Voyager 1 is now 50 astronomical units past that heliosphere boundary, and yet we still see effects coming from the sun. We expected the plasma, the particles out there to slowly fall off with distance from the heliopause. And yet on Voyager 1, in about 2020, we saw an abrupt jump in the particle density and in the magnetic field. Uh, we can't explain exactly what happened. There are ideas and models. Is it again a solar effect? Or is it something now coming from the outside in that's cause that plasma and magnetic field to make that, that large of a jump. The other thing that really fascinates me is when we launched the Voyagers, of course we were not thinking about the heliopause or what direction that would be. But it just turns out the two Voyagers are headed close to the nose of the heliopause, that point where you're closest to the sun. Uh, Voyager 1 is about 35 degrees above the ecliptic. Voyager 2 is about 35 degrees below just because of their final flybys. and getting back interesting information. Voyager 1's further away, so it takes longer for the effects from the sun to propagate, so we get both spatial and temporal coverage from the two Voyager spacecraft. It is just wonderful that even though they weren't designed for the work that they are doing, they're still doing it. And doing it so well. Does it get a little bit nerve-wracking uh, having to wait almost a day at the speed of light, or well, more than that, double that, to send a message and get something back. Voyager 1 is almost a light day away for a message to go from the Earth to Voyager. And so conversations with Voyager are very slow and it takes a lot of careful planning. And the spacecraft has on board software that can do a lot of things itself. If there's some kind of an anomaly or a problem, it can try and get into a mode that can wait for commands from the Earth to help fix what's going on. I think my last question is if there's something you love the general public to know about the Voyager missions. If there's a message or a fact that you really want people to know. The Voyager mission is truly iconic. This pair of spacecraft that have are lasted much longer than we ever expected to explore interstellar space. And what I really like about both Voyagers is they each carry a golden record. That golden record are the sights and sounds of Earth, about 100 pictures and hello in different languages. And those records, once the Voyagers no longer can communicate with Earth, 
then they become our silent ambassadors, carrying the golden record with the sights and sounds of our planet into interstellar space. And in about 40,000 years or so, each Voyager will pass relatively close to another star. We don't know for sure if those stars have planets, much less inhabited planets, but it's a chance for us to send our message in a bottle out into the cosmos. <laughs>